When you see the 747 take off or land, it's almost transfixing because the plane itself is so beautifully designed. I think that it's just always been the plane when everybody sees it. I think she's called the queen of the skies because she's big and powerful and she is going to reign forever. There's a, a lot of history with this airplane. It was the launch pad. It was a launch pad for commercial airlines. My dad was one of the original Credibles on the 47 and was here and helped build the very first one. Huh. Well, it's sort of hard to explain what an incredible is because what we did it was incredible. The building was still being built. It was an incredible project and it had to be accomplished within a, a small time frame compared to even now how they design an airplane. It was huge. I think it was intimidating to a lot of folks that looked at it. You know, I mean, the miles of wiring. Everybody knows the 747. Everybody can relate to it. Monday, September 30th, 1968, at the Boeing Company's Everett, Washington branch. Twenty-six stewardesses, representing the 26 airlines that have ordered 158 747s, take part in the christening ceremony. One, two, three! You know what? When the 747 took off, you look. It's just an awesome experience to, you know, to remember that you're a part of something that it had gone so far and so fast and so many different models and be accepted by the public as world-class traveler. So it's going to be a whole lot of generations that have been attached to this airplane. It's amazing. There's a lot of aircraft that have come and gone in that 50 years. So to see this plane still being wanted and desired and built today is an accomplishment in itself. February 9th, approaching takeoff time. The flight crew moves out to the waiting airplane. Pilot Jack Waddell. Co-pilot Brian Weigel. Flight engineer Jess Wallach. Takeoff requires only 4,300 feet of roll. Gross takeoff weight is 467,500 pounds each engine producing just under 39,000 pounds of thrust. Everything uh, looks very normal on the right side, Jack, and a uh, few doors look closed, and I'll go over and check the left. Beautiful. In the final approach, basic airspeed is 140 knots, landing weight 440,000 pounds. Flying qualities during the landing approach were almost 
it's unbelievable in that the airplane sits there like a stable platform. The pilot has to keep telling himself, oh, and I'll leave it alone. It doesn't need any help here. Okay, Jack, uh, natural question is, what are your impressions? <laughs> I guess this sounds complacent or something, but that ab thing is just ridiculously easy to fly. It's just a pilot's dream. Really a nice airplane to fly. It makes the best landing of any airplane. And you are in awe that somebody even dreamt that this could fly. Since its first commercial flight in 1970, Boeing 747 Jumbo Jet has flown over 3.5 billion passengers. Its development back in the 1960s was measured in billions of dollars. It was a pretty expensive airplane to develop at its time. You were building a whole new class of airplane, the biggest airplane in the world. It's one of the most recognizable planes to take to the skies, with its iconic hump, four engines, extensive landing gear, and sheer size. This is the world's very first 747-400 aircraft ever built. Originally flew uh, April 29th of 1988, so it's been around for 30 years now. For some reason, a lot of people like to see what the laboratories look like. So oh yeah. Galley here. This airplane had uh, seven galleys and 13 laboratories. And in the front of the cabin, the A zone, um, we have 14 live flat seats here in the front of the airplane. Here we are in the back of the 747. It really does show the immensity of this aircraft and how much uh, space is actually back here once all of this. So this is are. what the 747 floor looks like Correct. underneath it. Underneath, it, we are actually standing just over the center fuel tank and the duct work that you see here is part of the, basically the HVAC system um, that feeds the heating and the cooling to the passengers at their seats. You can also see pulleys and wires, cargo hold. And what we're looking at is the bulk bin where all of the last minute uh, bags are placed as well as any live animals. Pressure down. Not something you really want to see when you're flying, but this is what it looks like. If you were not paying attention, you may not have noticed the revolution happening in the airline industry. The days of attempting to build bigger and bigger airliners like the 850 passenger double decker A380 and the 660 passenger humped 747 are gone. The behemoths are simply being outcompeted by a new generation of planes. Many mourn the slow demise of these iconic planes, but you are benefiting from this change. The entire nature of air travel has changed to benefit you and your needs. Your local airport has more direct flights to distant lands than ever before, and the price of those tickets are cheaper than ever. Connecting flights are becoming rarer and rarer as this new breed of plane takes over. The plane at the forefront of this revolution, Boeing sat at the poker table and pushed all their chips forward. An all-in bet on a radical new future. And it paid off. The 787 revolutionized not only how the airline industry operates, but how the future of planes will be designed and built. This is the breakdown of the 787's materials. By weight, 55% of the 787 is made from composite materials, like carbon fiber reinforced plastics, 
making it the first commercial airliner made primarily with this new age material. The 787 is rivaled only by the Airbus A350 XWB, introduced four years after the 787 in 2015. So why are composite materials so desirable for the airline industry and how has the 787 made the most of their advantages? Composite materials are made up of two or more materials. Take carbon reinforced plastics. They are composed of extremely strong carbon fibers bound together by a plastic resin. Carbon fiber, made up of thousands of tiny thin fibers of carbon, is incredibly strong in tension, up to five times stronger than steel and one fifth of its weight. But these tiny fibers can't create a solid part by themselves. This is an image of a human hair beside a carbon fiber. The carbon fiber is the smaller one. And just like a human hair, they can bend and flex and separate very easily. So we need to first bind them together with the plastic resin to form a solid material. Otherwise, they just form a strong but flexible fabric. That flexibility as a fabric is exactly what makes composites so useful when creating the precise and elegant curves of a plane. With the right tooling and designers, composite components can be made into almost any shape imaginable. In the past, a disadvantage of making large aircraft components from composites was the time taken to manually lay up parts, where layers of carbon fiber and plastic resin had to be carefully constructed. It required skilled technicians and was inherently difficult to scale to the production quantities Boeing needed. To get around this, Boeing uses automated tape laying to produce massive aircraft sections. The 787's fuselage is created by wrapping a carbon fiber tape impregnated with a plastic resin around a rotating mold of the fuselage. This machine precisely controls the overlaps of the tape and the orientation of the fibers to ensure we are getting the most out of the carbon's tensile strength to resist the internal pressure loads and the longitudinal bending loads the fuselage will experience. One of the problems with this manufacturing method is that the part needs to be placed inside an oven to cure the resin. This hardens the plastic and creates a solid composite structure. Ovens the size of a wide body jet airliner fuselage are not exactly common and this is often the limiting factor on parts made this way and requires massive upfront investment to build a customized oven large enough to fit the part. But the benefits are well worth it. The first and most obvious is the strength carbon fiber provides. Previous generation airliners are typically pressurized to an equivalent of 8,000 feet. That's the same height as Mount Olympus in Washington state. High enough that the lower pressure would reduce your oxygen intake and your stomach will bloat as the air inside is higher pressure than the outside. This is uncomfortable and exacerbates the effects of jet lag, but thanks to the 787's stronger fuselage, it can increase its internal air pressure to an equivalent of 6,000 feet, 25% lower in altitude and about 7.3% higher in pressure. That may not sound like a lot, but it goes a long way in making the journey more comfortable. And at the very least, the person next to you won't be farting as much. Less farting is always nice, but my favorite benefit of the stronger fuselage is the absolutely massive windows. This is the 787 window, and these are windows of some equivalent aluminum airliners. They are absolutely massive. In aircraft made primarily from aluminum, having holes this large in metal panels would result in the buildup of stress at the window boundaries as the stress contours have to deviate around the window. This stress does not exceed the material strength, but over repeated pressure cycles, tiny imperfections in the metal can grow into even larger cracks and eventually fail. Holes this large in an aluminum airliner would severely shorten the plane's flying career before it needed to be fixed or disposed of. Kind of like how cracks in McGregor's leg shortened his career. But it's not a problem for the 787, thanks to Composite's relative immunity to fatigue. You could kick Dustin Poirier's kneecap as many times as you like with carbon fiber shins. 
The carbon fiber construction provides plenty of benefits for the airline operators too, because the fuselage is just one massive part. Boeing was able to eliminate all joints and all the fasteners needed to join them together. The sections that used to be made up of 1,500 aluminium sheets riveted together using 40 to 50,000 fasteners are now just one massive carbon fibre section. Carbon fibre's strength to weight ratio already makes the fuselage lighter, but eliminating joints and fasteners makes it even lighter again. The reduced weight reduces fuel burn, but this fuselage is also incredibly aerodynamic because it doesn't have thousands of little bumps and ridges all over it from those joints and rivets. Composite materials help reduce drag in other ways too. One of my favourite things about the 787 is its elegant wings. The main structural member of a wing is the wing spar. Its primary role is to resist the upwards bending force during flight. It's essentially just an I-beam, a shape optimised to resist bending loads. The wing spars of the 787 are constructed from carbon fibre composites, while the ribs, the structural members connecting the two spars, and that support the wing skin are machined out of solid aluminium plates. The structure the rear and forward wing spars form with ribs running between is called the wing box, and it forms the main load-bearing structure of the wing, while also being a literal box for fuel to sit inside. The carbon fibre composite spar provides the wing fantastic strength. Strength is quantified by the force required to completely fracture material, but carbon fibre composites have another important quality that makes them perfect for aircraft wings, their maximum elastic strain. There are two types of deformation, elastic and plastic deformation. Elastic means the material will snap back into its original shape after the load is removed, like an elastic band. Plastic means it will permanently deform and won't return to its original shape once the load is removed, something we don't want to happen. This is permanent damage. Carbon fibre composites can deform further before they strike this plastic deformation zone at about 1.9%, while aircraft aluminium begins permanently deforming at less than 1%. That means we can bend carbon composites further before we need to worry about permanently deforming them, and that means we can make our wings super flexible. During flight, the wingtip of the 787 can move upwards by 3 meters. That sounds like a lot, but in order to get certified by the FAA, every plane needs to be able to handle 150% of the plane's absolute maximum expected load during flight for 3 seconds. And during that test, the 787's wing bent upwards by 7.6 meters. That's a great deal of bending despite carbon fiber composites being stiffer than aluminium, meaning it takes more force to deform the same volume of material. But critically, 787 wings are not the same shape as their aluminium counterparts. This ability to withstand greater bending allowed engineers to make the 787's wings with a much higher aspect ratio. Aspect ratio is the ratio between the wing span and the mean cord, or wing width. A high aspect ratio would be a long skinny wing like a glider, while a low aspect ratio would be a delta wing of a fighter jet. A traditional airliner has an aspect ratio of about 9, like the 787's predecessor, the 777, but the 787 has a massive aspect ratio at 11. This is what causes the 787's wings to flex so much during flight. Composites are actually stiffer than aluminium, but their ability to withstand high deformation allowed the engineers at Boeing to create a much higher aspect ratio wing, a longer, narrower wing that would bend more. But this comes with some huge benefits. The planes with the highest aspect ratio are gliders. For an unpowered plane, the highest priority is minimizing energy loss to drag. This allows the glider to stay in the air for extended periods with no engine. These types of aircraft typically have aspect ratios greater than 30, and these aircraft have the lowest drag penalties as a result of vortex drag. This is the drag caused by air mixing from the high pressure zone under the wing with low pressure air above the wing, forming vortices at the wing tip. By spreading the area of the wing over a longer span, 
we minimize the pressure that drives this mixing at the wing tip, and thus minimize the energy lost to the vortices. Normally, higher aspect ratio wings have lower internal volumes. For an unpowered glider, this isn't an issue. But for a plane that needs that storage space for fuel, it is. Less storage volume for fuel means lower range, and one of the primary goals of the 787 is to be an efficient, long-range aircraft, capable of allowing airliners to open new routes that were once deemed impossible. Thankfully, modern planes like the 787 use a new kind of aerofoil, the supercritical aerofoil. Older aerofoils look something like this, a reasonably symmetric design with a sharp nose and gentle curves on the upper and lower surface. And this is a supercritical wing. The leading edge is blunter with a larger radius, the top is relatively flat, and the lower portion has this strange cusp at the back. This aerofoil has much more useful internal volume thanks to its blunt leading edge and larger thickness to cord ratio. Helping solve our low internal volume problem associated with high aspect ratio wings. The supercritical wing was first tested by NASA on a modified TF-8A Crusader. And you can really see the similarities in design ethos between the experimental plane's sleek wings with the 787. But increased internal volume is not why NASA developed the supercritical wing. NASA developed it to delay the onset of shockwave formation over the wings. When air travels over a wing, the air on top accelerates. This means that even though the plane itself might be traveling below the speed of sound, the air over the wing may break it and create a shockwave. This shockwave decreases lift and causes an increase in drag. This kind of drag is called wave drag and planes need to fly below the speed this occurs at. The speed is called the critical Mach number. The supercritical wing was designed to increase the critical Mach number. The flat top of the supercritical wing means the air does not accelerate as much as it would over a classic aerofoil. Of course, this causes a loss in lift because that fast moving air is causing a drop in pressure on top of the wing. To compensate, supercritical aerofoils have this concave curvature underneath the wing, which causes an increase of pressure there to compensate. This increase in pressure does not affect the critical Mach number, while the larger radius of the leading edge increases the lift generated at higher angles of attack. This is because air struggles to follow the tighter turns of a smaller radius leading edge, which causes earlier flow detachment and stall. The larger radius delays this flow separation. This aerofoil shape changes continually as you travel the length of the wing, twisting and curving in computer calculated precision, optimizing the wing shape to be as efficient as possible. And Composites provided the engineers with the confidence that these shapes could be manufactured. The skin is simply laid down on a mold with automated tape laying once again. We don't have to beat metal into shape each and every time we want to recreate these delicate curves. The fibers of the wing have even been laid in specific patterns to tailor the stiffness of the wing in different areas. This means the wing deforms exactly as the 787's engineers wanted to as it gains speed. So the wing shape actually changes during flight to better suit the needs at different speeds. This is called aeroelastic tailoring and is the forefront of state-of-the-art aeronautical engineering today. The 787 also features a novel device designed to reduce turbulent flow over the tail of the aircraft. Two types of flow states exist in aerodynamics. Laminar flow occurs at low velocities and is characterized by fluid layers flowing smoothly over each other in neat, orderly layers. Laminar flow is predictable and non-erratic and does not create significant drag. Turbulent flow is far more common, but still very little is known about how to predict its behavior. It is very difficult to control because of the formation of small vortices called eddies in the flow, making the flow highly erratic. Turbulent flow occurs at higher flow velocities and causes a significant increase in drag. At cruising speeds of 80 to 85% of the speed of sound, turbulent flow is ultimately unavoidable, but we can work to minimize it. 
Boeing has developed a technology that helps them delay and control the formation of turbulent flow called hybrid laminar flow control. Details on their implementation of the technology are sparse. This technology is capable of reducing fuel burn by as much as 30% and so companies are keeping their research extremely secretive to keep their competitive advantage. Here's what we know. In the late 80s and early 90s, NASA and Boeing began investigating a suction system on the 757 that would draw in boundary layer air, that is, the layer of very slow moving air that clings to the surface of moving objects. The outside skin was permeable to air through tiny perforations, too small for the naked eye to see. Manufacturing the permeable surface while also keeping the tiny holes clear of debris is one of the many challenges with this technology. The outer and inner skin were then attached to an elaborate plumbing system that was connected to a turbo pump which sucked air from the boundary layer of air that would form along the plane's surface. By doing this, they could drastically delay and reduce the size of the turbulent flow and in turn reduce the drag on the plane. There is no space for this ducting system inside the wings of the 787, but from what we do know, it is inside both the horizontal and vertical tails. However, the only clue of their presence are these tiny doors, whose purpose are a mystery to me with little to no information available online, a testament of how advanced this plane is. Composites give plenty of advantages, but it does come with some disadvantages. When we examine the plane's composition, one material jumps out at me. 15% of this plane is titanium. That's much higher than normal. Titanium is an expensive material, so they must have had a good reason to use it over aluminium. Aluminium is typically corrosion resistant when it's left on its own, but when it is placed in direct contact with carbon fiber composites, something strange happens. The aluminium begins to corrode incredibly quickly. Something about carbon fiber causes aluminium to oxidize and fall apart. Carbon fiber is like aluminium's kryptonite. This phenomenon is called galvanic corrosion, and it happens when two materials that have dissimilar electric potentials or nobilities are placed in contact with an electrolyte, like salt water. If we look at the galvanic series, which quantifies materials' nobilities, we can see that graphite is very noble on the far end of the left scale, while aluminium is quite far to the right. When this occurs, an electric potential forms between the two materials that causes the two materials to trade electrons and ions, which results in the anode being eaten away. This effect is made even worse when the surface of the more noble material, the cathode, is very large in comparison to the less noble material, the anode. Say, for example, when carbon fiber composites are fastened together using aluminium fasteners. To avoid this corrosion, the engineers needed to pick a material closer to carbon in the galvanic series, and the closest suitable metal was titanium. This has been a huge source of cost in manufacturing. Boeing's production cost was higher than its sales price for quite some time, meaning they were making a loss on each aircraft sold. This is fairly typical for new airliners, as R&D and manufacturing tooling costs take time to recoup, and companies like Boeing typically spread these costs over a period of time on each plane, instead of just having a massive negative balance sheet in one year. But because the 787 was so radically new, these sunk development costs, called deferred costs, were expected to reach 25 billion before Boeing even reached a break-even point on each plane sold, where the cost of manufacturing equaled the sales price. In comparison, the Boeing 777 reached 3.7 billion. To recoup costs as fast as possible, it was essential that Boeing reduce the cost of production, and high on their list was the elimination of titanium parts where possible. The frame around the cockpit windows, for example, were initially made out of titanium, but were changed to aluminium with a special coating to prevent corrosion. While some parts that were originally titanium were changed to composites, like the door frames. Other improvements were sought to make the manufacturing process for titanium less costly. Many metallic parts used on aircraft start off as large blocks of metal 
that have to be machined down into their final shape. This results in a ton of wasted metal as the metal is gradually shaved away. Aircraft manufacturers quantify this wastage with something called a buy to fly ratio and it's a huge source of increased manufacturing costs. Costs that Boeing has tackled by collaborating with Norsk Titanium, a titanium 3D printing company. Now, making 3D printed metal parts is not easy. Most titanium 3D printing involves a powdered titanium that is melted together using lasers. Researchers used high-speed X-ray imaging to visualize what happens during this process and found a lot of imperfections. The track varies in height, the powder gets blasted away, resulting in varying thickness and separated tracks, and even bubbles form, causing pores in the metal. This creates parts with a lot of micro imperfections, and imperfections lead to decreased life as fatigue causes cracks to form. We can visualize a material's fatigue strength by plotting on an SN curve, which places the magnitude of the alternating stress on the y-axis and the number of cycles it survived on the x-axis. For traditional machined titanium, it looks something like this, whereas for 3D printed parts, it looks like this. 3D printed parts simply fail much sooner because of these tiny imperfections. Norsk has worked to improve this. Instead of using laser sintering with powder, Norsk have developed a revolutionizing, patented, wire-based metallic 3D printing system for titanium that they monitor with 600 frames per second cameras for quality control. These 3D printed parts are then machined down into their final shape, reducing the total titanium used by 25 to 50 percent, and their printing method is 50 to 100 times faster than the powder printing method. This process resulted in the first ever FAA certified. This is not a typical design choice for aircraft wings, and once again, it was influenced by the 787's composite construction, because composite materials are not good conductors. Carbon fibers are great conductors, but problems arise because of the plastic resin binding them together, as this resin is an insulating material, preventing the passage of electricity which is a massive problem for planes as getting hit by lightning is not a rare occurrence. One study calculated that lightning strikes occurred once every 3,000 hours of flying between 1950 and 1975. A 787 was struck by lightning while taking off from Heathrow. Upon landing in India, 42 to 46 holes were found in the fuselage as a result of resistive heating. The plane survived and was flown back to London for repairs with no passengers aboard, but Composite's vulnerability to this kind of damage is a drawback, and the repair process is more complicated than with aluminium. However, this strike could have been much worse. If the electricity does not run smoothly along the surface of the plane and exit, it may cause a spark in the fuel tanks and cause an explosion. This kind of accident was not uncommon in the early days of the airline industry. Pan Am Flight 214 was struck by lightning while it flew in a holding pattern, waiting for a lightning storm to pass at Philadelphia International Airport in 1967. Its left wing fuel tank exploded, causing the plane to barrel out of control to the ground in flames. Since then, the aviation sector has implemented rigorous safety measures and lightning protection tests to ensure an accident like this could never happen again. Early 787 wings were designed with copper strips to ensure the electrons had a path of low resistance along the surface of the wing, ensuring they wouldn't travel to the fuel tank and cause a spark, while also preventing resistive heating damage to the composite structure. Fasteners were sealed with an insulating material to stop electricity from traveling down the metallic fastener into the fuel tank and the fastener themselves were fitted with compression rings and a sealant to eliminate potential spark locations caused by gaps and sharp edges. Finally, the 787 has a nitrogen inerting system that fills the tank with nitrogen. Ignition can't happen without oxygen. Boeing has since removed two of these protections in a cost-saving measure, removing the copper mesh and insulating caps, which drew concern and criticism but Boeing argues that between the nitrogen inerting system and the other safety measures, these expensive features were not needed. Where composites couldn't be used, other materials were chosen. 
The leading edge of the wing and tail, the tail cone, and parts of the engine cowling were all made from aluminium or other metals. The leading edges of the plane needed aluminium because of composites poor impact resistance. While composites have extremely high strength, they can be brittle on sudden impacts such as bird strikes, which most commonly happen at the leading edge of the wing or on the engines. Metals are able to deform on impact with a reduced chance of fracture, instead of shattering as composites would. Aluminium leading edges were also beneficial for the purpose of de-icing because it is a good thermal conductor. If you have ever flown on a very cold day, you may have seen a truck spray fluid onto the wings of the plane. This is de-icing fluid, a heated mixture of glycol and water. It's needed because most planes aren't capable of de-icing themselves on the ground. The 787 can when fed with external power because it uses a new type of de-icing system. The 787 uses electrically heated blankets bonded to the surface of the slats, which are able to heat the surface of the wing and melt or prevent any ice formation on the leading edge of the wing. Traditionally, ice is prevented by extracting hot bleed air from the engine and piping it to vulnerable areas such as the leading edge of the wing where ice buildup could severely interfere with the wing's operation. This draws valuable energy away from the engines and increases fuel consumption, while also requiring a complicated network of tubing and exhausts which add weight and increases complexity of construction and maintenance. The electric heating system is twice as efficient as the extracted bleed air system, as no excess energy is lost through venting air to the atmosphere, and it also reduces drag as the exhaust holes for the bleed air on the lower side of the wing create drag. The 787 is actually the first commercial airliner that has eliminated this bleed air system, which was a huge technical challenge and required a complete redesign of several systems and an entirely new engine. By increasing capacity and lowering ticket costs, it quickly became known as the queen of the skies and was the first plane to have two aisles and overhead bins. Boeing was already on the map when the 747 came out, but what the 747 did for Boeing was inject the company with a little bit more glamour, a little bit more sexiness. The 747 was always intended to have dual roles. Uh, it was designed from the beginning to carry both passengers and cargo. The flight deck was put on top of the plane so that the nose would open for easier loading. This gave the 747 its upper deck. Boeing produced the 747 for the last 55 years, during which a total of 1,574 airplanes were built for over 100 plus customers. The list price for a 747-8 in 2022 was over $400 million. But over the last few decades, airlines have looked for more ways to cut costs and to make airplanes as efficient as possible. It was the beginning of the jet age. In the 1950s, Boeing introduced the 707, America's first jet airliner. Jet engines were safer, cheaper, and faster than piston engines. The number of people flying quadrupled between 1955 and 1972, as it became faster, more accessible, and financially possible. Pan American World Airways, or Pan Am, was one of the biggest carriers at the time. So Pan American came to Boeing and said, we need an airplane twice the size of the 707. The head of Pan American Airways, Juan Tripp, said to Bill Allen, the CEO of Boeing, if you build that airplane, I'll buy it. And Bill Allen turned to Juan Tripp and said, if you buy it, I'll build it. And that's how the 747 got started. In 1966, Pan Am put in an order for 25 new 747s. One of the original design ideas for the 747 really was going along with what Pan American wanted, and that was building a double-decker. Building a plane twice the size of its predecessor had a significant amount of challenges. The first iterations of the design were entirely double-decker, but that made it difficult to evacuate potentially 500 passengers safely and in a timely manner. And this moment of innovation came in, and that was, instead of making a double-decker, why don't we make a wider airplane? Why don't we make a twin aisle, go 20 feet wide? And so the twin aisle, the wide-body jet, was born. Even though the design wasn't a full double-decker, it was still twice the size of the 707 and required new innovations. What made it possible to make this giant jet was a revolution in engine technology. These new engines, especially compared to the turbojet engines of the day, were very efficient. The 747 wasn't Boeing's biggest project at the time. It was also working on the 2707 supersonic transport, or SST. 
What's interesting about the 747 when it was first introduced is airlines expected it to be an interim aircraft that they would use between their first generation of jets and the coming wave of supersonic planes that were expected to enter service later in the 1970s. So the designers of the 747, they understood this, that at some point in the future, the 747s would be converted into freighters. And so they purposely set out to make the 747 the perfect freighter. The SST program lost government funding and the prototypes were never finished. Well, obviously, the supersonic era didn't happen quite the way we expected. And so, frankly, I think that led to a much longer life and much greater success for the 747. Once they finalized the specs for the plane, how are airports going to handle this plane that is more than twice as large with wingspan, more than twice the width of previous aircraft, and an airplane that is much heavier? So that led to how Boeing designed the landing gear. It has 18 wheels, and that's designed to spread out the weight of the plane so that it could use existing runways. But some airports had to widen their runways and taxiways. They built new terminals to handle this. They had to invest in new baggage handling systems. In fact, the plane was so big, Boeing had to build a plant around it during its construction in Everett, Washington. Today, that building is the biggest in the world by volume, and where Boeing builds its other wide bodies. These costs, along with the SST project and the development of its other new jet, the 737, created a significant financial strain on the company. One of the biggest challenges for Boeing, how do they fund building it? Boeing bet the house on the 747. There were people who said, literally, that this airplane would not fly. There were also people who said, financially, this airplane would not fly. It was a tremendous risk. That became one of the big issues in those days, that the money to build this airplane, that, that Boeing had to negotiate with, with creditors constantly to keep this program going, keep the company going. But that didn't stop Boeing. Joe Sutter, who is known as the father of the 747, led the design team, and they, along with other Boeing employees, were nicknamed the Incredibles for building the 747 in just 29 months. When the first 747 rolled out of the factory, it was a huge event. All of the airlines who placed an order sent flight attendants to represent them, and each company's logo was included on the fuselage. In 1970, Boeing delivered 93 total 747 aircraft with over 60 passenger versions. Pan Am will bring you the world's first 747. Pan Am operated the first commercial flight in 1970. When it arrived in London, crowds of spectators greeted the arrival. Because the public was so entranced with the 747, all of the major airlines had to have this airplane as their flagship. Its jumbo size was something passengers, pilots, and flight attendants had to get used to. My first introduction to the 747 was as a flight attendant in 1972. It was huge. Yeah, all of a sudden, the biggest airplane up until then was a 707 that needed five or six flight attendants. The 747 needed 14, and it had five different sections, and each section was a different size. It was chaos at the beginning. So many airlines used the upper deck level of their first versions of the 747 as lounges for their first class passengers. Some airlines had lounges in coach, and American Airlines even had a piano bar in coach on its 747 for a short time. Very extravagant, very luxurious. We had fresh flowers in crystal vases. Each meal had a special wine that was paired with it and had to learn how to properly open champagne. The first ever 747 prototype is still on display at the Museum of Flight in Seattle. This is the upper deck experience. This was the interior that Boeing used to show the airlines the possibility of what that first class, that premier experience, that premier flying experience could be. Passengers could come up the spiral staircase and have a moment in the lounge. It was the favorite airplane of the pilots. Captain Lynn Rippelmeyer would eventually become the first woman to pilot a 747 and the first woman to captain a 747 transatlantic flight. She got her start flying cargo for Seaboard World Airlines. They had professional engineers, so if you got hired as a pilot, you immediately went to the first officer seat. So this very unique set of circumstances happened at the exact right time for me to get hired by Seaboard World and as a 747 first officer and become the first woman to fly a 747. 
I went to work for People Express, first as a 737 first officer, upgraded with any gear to captain, again, which is almost unheard of, and then we got 747s. So I became a 747 captain at People Express in 1984. I had so much confidence in that plane, it flies beautifully. I think why many pilots like it is it makes the best landing of any airplane. The plane was designed for long-haul flights, making international travel more accessible and affordable. It only went to what we would consider to be important cities, major markets, world capitals. And having a 747 serve your airport was a badge of honor. What was also uh, interesting is airlines viewed the 747 as legitimizing them. So a lot of airlines ordered the 747 when it was first introduced, even though probably they shouldn't have. It also helped transform the air cargo market. It wasn't long that the 747, with its capacity to be a great freighter, that that freighter version came out. And that was uh, in the early 70s with Lufthansa. And this is really where the airplane came into it, its own. Airlines all over the world have flown the 747. It really runs the gamut from United Airlines to Delta Airlines, KLM, Lufthansa, British Airways, Qantas. It was really a plane that flew all over the world. Over the next few decades, the 747 continued to evolve with newer, improved versions. It also served other purposes, like government transport, including Air Force One. In 1977, Boeing delivered a modified 747 to NASA to use to ferry the space shuttle from its landing spot in California back to Cape Canaveral in Florida. In 1988, the 747-400 was introduced. This version had more efficient engines, longer range, and a modernized cockpit. It was the company's best-selling version. Overall, the 747 safety record has been good. That's not to say it's been perfect. Some of these problems, though, are more airline-related in terms of their maintenance than the design of the airplane. But the 747 has been involved with some very tragic events. Two of the most visible were the bombing of Pan Am 103, a flight from uh, London to New York, and the crash of TWA Flight 800 off the coast of Long Island, uh, both of which were 747s. But the 747 was a well-designed aircraft. It actually is probably the safest airplane in the, in the air because of so many redundancies. The more engines you have, the more backups you have to all the systems because each engine provides the hydraulic power, the electrics, the pneumatics, uh, the air conditioning. Everything that the airplane needs comes from an engine. And when you have four of them, you've got three backups. That airplane can fly on one engine. It's not gonna keep altitude. You're gonna wanna be pretty close to a runway but everything will still be working that you need to get the airplane safely back down on the ground. Boeing saw a rise in deliveries through the 1990s before its decline. The 747 was one of the most geographically widely ordered airplane in the world. For a plane of its size, it helped spur the development of the airline hub and spoke route networks that we now take for granted. But the 747 was not an airplane designed to serve shorter routes. And so as a result, that limited the appeal of the 747. And it also limited the usefulness of the 747. Fares, routes, and service were regulated by the federal government until the Airline Deregulation Act was enacted in 1978. This created more competition among the airlines and brought fare prices down. It also created dozens of new airlines and the expansions of smaller ones. With four engines, of course, you're gonna use more fuel than you, than you are with three or two. So they were finding ways to fly an airplane much cheaper and more efficiently. And the 7.4 didn't cut it. It's not because people don't like it. it certainly isn't because pilots don't like it. In the 80s, airlines started to do away with the luxurious lounges and replaced it with seats for increased revenue. Airlines also pack a lot more seats onto planes than they used to. That is the idea, you know, they want to get as many people into coach as possible. In 1990, Boeing 747s made up 28% of the world's passenger wide-body fleet. That's down to just 2% in 2022. And despite the rise in air freight during the pandemic, in 2022, the 747 made up just 21% of the world's wide-body cargo fleet down from 71% in 1990. In fact, Pan Am clung to that plane far too long, and it's 
partially responsible for the airline's demise. In 1991, Pan Am ended operations. So from the mid-1980s into the 2000s, you saw fewer and fewer airlines flying 747s. Those that had them generally reduced the number of 747s in their fleet. Despite all these signs that airlines were moving away from four-engine aircraft, Airbus, Boeing's main competitor, launched its super jumbo, the A380, in 2007. The company spent billions on developing it and overtook the 747 as the world's largest commercial plane. It is a full double-decker and could be configured to seat as many as 853 passengers. But many airlines were already moving away from the 747 and the hub-and-spoke model for more efficient twin-engine aircraft. Airbus ended production of the A380 in 2021. This is the last 747, number 1,574. When we visited Boeing's Everett Washington factory, the company was putting the final touches on it before heading out to be painted and flight tested. It's an exciting emotional time for us. The 747 has been absolutely transformational, certainly to all of aviation and as part of that to, to Boeing. It laid the foundation for the twin aisle aircraft that followed. Boeing's only going to build planes that airlines want. The order stopped coming in for the 747 because Boeing and others have built other aircraft that can do the, the same job that the 747 can, or close to it. So the 787 Dreamliner and the Airbus A350 can fly routes that the 747 couldn't. They can go much further nonstop. The company delivered its last passenger version to Korean Air in 2017. That same year, all U.S. airlines stopped flying it. When the 747s were retired, people were really sad. United's last 747 flight from San Francisco to Hawaii had its departure covered live on television in San Francisco. It was a big deal. Boeing 747 was the most successful widebody until 2018, after Boeing's 777 took the number one slot. When you look at the 777-8F freighter and you compare it to the 747, it can carry similar to cargo levels, but with the twin engine economics. And it has over 30% reduction in fuel burn, which is great for our customers' efficiency, as well as for sustainability and the environment. Demand for cargo versions remained strong until 2020, when the company announced it would end production of the 747 freighter version. It just really made sense that we would shift to the twin engine model over the four engine model of the 747. Atlas Air has the largest fleet of 747s and will take final delivery of the last plane in early 2023. The ending of the 747 comes at a time when the aviation industry is looking to transform itself with more fuel-efficient, environmentally-friendly technologies. Boeing's CEO recently said the company would not design a new airplane in the next decade, while the company waits for new fuel-efficient engines to be developed since advances in engine technology doesn't yet warrant enough of a fuel cut for buyers. As for the queen of the skies, the end of production doesn't mean you won't see her flying around anymore. There are 396 747s still flying, 311 are freight, 44 of them are passenger planes, and 41 for VIP or private service, including Virgin Orbit. Six airlines still operate the 747. Lufthansa is the largest with 25 in its fleet. The airlines that have it will probably continue to operate it for maybe another 10 years or so, perhaps a little bit longer. I think we'll continue to see the 747 operate as a freighter for decades to come because it's a really good freight airplane. There's plenty of other ways to experience a 747 too. There are hotels, a water park, and many other aviation museums around the world that have them on display. A testament to how iconic and transformative the Queen of the Skies has been over the last several decades. The 747 is beloved in a way that most other commercial airliners are not. I remember my first 747 flight. It was on American Airlines from Kennedy to Dallas Love Field. I don't think you're gonna see you know, people crying when the 777 or the 787 Dreamliner decades from now is retired. They just don't have the same emotional connection. She was my first jet. That was the first jet I ever flew. And I don't know if there's many other pilots that can say that. So I guess that's why she's my baby. And I think because I felt like if I took care of her, she'd take care of me. You could say it's the hump, it's the shape, the size, all those things. 
But what I think, this airplane, it inspires us that we can do these amazing things. And I think that that is what has captured everybody's imagination. Why there's such an emotional attachment to this airplane that it just reminds us as human beings that we can do amazing things.